Hello, and welcome to this video panel by the Center for Geopolitics at the University of Cambridge. My name is Philip Hirsch, and I will be chairing tonight's discussion on Europe in the Middle East. In 1971, the then six members of the European community launched a new institutional framework called European Political Cooperation, or EPC. Its aim was to add some sort of foreign policy cooperation to the young but growing European project. At the start, EPC only had two focus areas, Eastern Europe and the Middle East. And even though EPC was quite a loose format, it is the starting point of a common European foreign policy more generally and a common European Middle Eastern policy more specifically. So tonight, 50 years later, we're trying to take stock of what Europe since then has achieved in the Middle East. The EU and its member states have played an important role in some areas, such as the Iran nuclear deal, but it has also been criticized as ineffective when it comes to its response to the Arab Spring or the civil war in Syria. Europe as an external actor has committed to pursuing its own interests in the MENA region, but it often stands in the shadow of other regional players, such as the US or Russia. Or maybe it just seems to be standing in their shadow. Tonight, this is what we're trying to make sense of, to learn more about what European interests in the MENA region are, how Europe tries to pursue those interests, and whether it does or does not succeed in this endeavor. And of course, since Brexit, we might, we might want to talk about the difference between European and EU foreign policy, if that makes sense in this context. We have three renowned experts with us to discuss whether in the Middle East, Europe is indeed an actor of its own right or just a bystander. Nathalie Tocci is director of the Italian Instituto Affari Internazionali, as well as, the, as a special advisor to EU High Representative and Vice President of the Commission, Josep Borrell. Professor Eckhard Wertz is director of the Institute for Middle East Studies at the German Institute for Global and Area Studies, or GIGA, in Hamburg. And Julian barnes Dacey is director of the Middle East and North Africa program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you so much to all three of you for being with us tonight. It is an honor to have you. As always, I just wanna make some quick technical remarks before we begin. We will start the event tonight with introductory statements by our speakers before moving to Q&A in the second part of the event. Already now, I want to encourage you, the audience, to submit questions, which you can do at any time. I just ask that when you submit your question, you state your name and affiliation as well. And please submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and I will do my best to address as many questions as possible throughout the event. As always, this event is being recorded and it will be made available on the Center's website and YouTube channel by the end of this or next week. The address will be added to the chat shortly, along with our Twitter handle, if you would like to tweet about tonight's discussion. And that should be all for that. And now I think we can go straight into our discussion. Um, Natalie, let's start with you. Um, you have not only written a lot about European Union foreign policy, you've also been part of the process which led to the formulation of a European strategy towards the world, the, the, the global strategy. Um, so how do you think from a strategic point of view then, um, where does the Middle East fit into sort of European foreign policy more generally? Um, and, and, and how would you describe sort of European strategic pers perspectives on, on the region? Well, I think, Philip, that the, um, I mean, in many respects, one can say that uh, European foreign policy in the MENA region, uh, more, more broadly, um, the problem with it is that it has not changed. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has not changed while the world has changed and the region has changed. So in a sense, you know, you sort of started off by saying, you know, sort of, you know, are, are Europeans you know, have Europeans exited the scene? You know, are Europeans less effective? Um, and I think the, you know, the, the answer to that question, uh, in a sense, has less to do with the fact that Europeans have not been sufficiently responsive to, to a fundamentally changed context. So, I mean, you know, in terms of what uh, Europeans do, well, you know, it, it hasn't, it hasn't changed much. I mean, there are still neighborhood policies, there is still diplomacy, there is still an attempt to support uh, peace processes when they exist. Uh, there is, uh, you know, so th there is still uh, a very, very limited use of CSDP mm, when it comes to the region. So there was never a, an, a, an era in which this was different. 
the problem was that um, back in the 1990s, which in a sense is, is really when European foreign policy was, was kind of, you know, first emerged and was really first conceived, uh, we lived in a completely different world, you know, we lived in what we now commonly define as the international liberal order, where, where particularly in the Middle East, there was a very dominant presence of the United States, at times as Europeans, uh, we didn't like what the United States did. I'll just think about uh, the 2003 war in Iraq. Most of the time we agreed with what it did and we were happy to play second fiddle to the United States. I mean, you know, if you just think of the way in which the whole Barcelona process was conceived as basically a sort of backup, yeah, a soft power backup in a sense to what the United States was trying to, uh, to do more, more broadly in the region. So it, the, the tragedy is that, in a sense, we keep on doing the same stuff, but we keep on doing the same stuff at a time in which, firstly, obviously, the United States itself has, it, it is in a phase of relative retreat for the region. Huh? I mean, still, its absolute uh, power in the region is, is, is considerable, um, but its relative power is very clearly diminishing. Uh, and in fact, it would like to see uh, Europeans taking on greater responsibility when it comes to, to the MENA region. But Europeans are kind of not used to this, so they're kind of at a loss as to what, what to do. The region has also itself changed fundamentally. I mean, all, all conflicts and crises are obviously still there. Uh, and we kind of, you know, now and then remember that they exist. Uh, like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, when sort of new bouts of, of, of violence break, break out. Uh, uh, newer conflicts have merged. Fragilities are far more acute uh, than they were in the past. And of course, regional rivalries uh, that used to be, in a sense, far simpler, in the sense that it used to be about the Arab-Israeli divide. And, and now, as we know, this is a region which is made up of multiple cleavages. And I'm not going to go through them all. They're all, I think, fairly, fairly well versed in, in all of this. So the region has fundamentally changed. Europe, uh, the, the international context, and particularly the role of the United States, has fundamentally changed. Both gl other global powers, as well as regional powers, uh, are far more dominant in the region in pursuing their interests. See Russia, see Turkey, uh, see the Gulf states across North Africa and the Middle East. And so the only thing that has fundamentally changed is our perception of the role of Europeans. Uh, because, if you like, European weakness is exactly the same as it was in the past. It's just far more obvious uh, in our own eyes what that weakness is, is all about. Huh? Clearly because now there are powers that pursue their interests. Of course, the United States pursued its interests, but we somehow assumed that the United States pursuing its interests was somehow conver relatively convergent with uh, the, 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 our own indirect pursuit, if you like, of our interests. So it's the concept, the, you know, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that it's the context that has fundamentally changed. So I, I think to sort of, you know, close on, on these first, uh, first few remarks, um, I think that the ultimate political choice that as Europeans, when it comes to North Africa and the Middle East, and, and I think actually you can make this argument more broadly, uh, certainly across the entire neighborhood, meaning also to the East, the fundamental political choice that we're not really confronting is what do we actually prefer? So let's stop assuming that there will be a moment in which the United States will be back in the region. So you know, that, that time has, has passed. And let's just take that as a given. What do we actually prefer? Do we prefer continuing in our passivity? So continuing as we are uh, and essentially in allowing other powers to rightly, I would argue, pursue their interests. This is what countries do, they kind of pursue their interests. And this option has pluses and, and minuses, of course. I mean, as a plus, it has giving ourselves the illusion, at least, I would argue it's an illusion, but giving ourselves the illusion of being insulated from the problems of the region. Uh, so, and that is obviously a, a plus as far as, if you like, domestic politics is concerned. Of course, the minus is all the frustration that comes with regional powers pursuing their interests in a way which obviously we don't particularly like. And so we get increasingly frustrated with Turkey, with UAE, with, with, with Russia in the region. So it's got pluses and minuses. But of course, there's also pluses and minuses to be considered with, with the alternative. 
If we were to take on greater responsibility, if we were to take on greater risk, and I really want to highlight the word risk when it comes to, uh, to the region, uh, because we would be doing it without simply the backup, if you like, or rather backing up uh, the, the United States. Um, obviously, risk comes with potential cost, uh, which includes also the cost of, of human lives, and it comes with the potential benefit uh, of being able to have a share, if you like, in promoting what our own interests and our own values are. And, and I think that the, the, the tragedy is that we're ducking this political choice. I don't want to say here, yeah, I mean, I've got my own personal preferences as to what we should be doing, but then again, I'm skewed with a foreign policy, if you like, uh, lens to all of this. But my, my point is simply to say, let's confront that very basic political question in our own democracies. And I think that none of our countries are really doing this. And I'll stop there. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, that was a great um, um, setting of the scene. Um, Eckhart, uh, and Natalie has um, pointed to the you know, European foreign policy towards the region being quite constant, but the region is changing. How would you describe the, the sort of the essence of European or the European approach to the Middle East? Well, I mean, we are talking about a foreign policy of an organization that doesn't have a foreign minister. Um, and as long as it only has a high representative and the high representative can only say as much as the European consensus allows him to do so. So, and I think unless that doesn't change, that there's more integration and that there's uh, decision-making by qualified uh, a majority, and there's a real possibility to sanction wayward uh, members, like for example, Hungary, which is not a democracy, by the way, anymore, uh, which kind of seriously damaged the European soft brand in the region as well, because how do you want to lecture authoritarians if one of yours is one uh, uh, as well? Um, so the question is, why are we talking about European foreign policy, essentially? And I think there are two reasons. First of all, we want to have it like that, right? We see that uh, uh, even large member countries like France or Germany uh, uh, do not have the critical mass nowadays to be taken seriously in the middle run in international politics. And I think the UK is making this experience right now and it will not be a happy one. So um, we want to be, uh, have it like that, although we might not be ready to, to make the necessary compromises. The other reason is that, of course, the EU is now much more powerful, has much more uh, uh, possibilities at hand than it used uh, to have, right? Kissinger famously remarked uh, which number is he supposed to dial uh, uh, when he wants to call Europe. Well, nowadays, uh, if he has somebody on the line, Jose Boré or so, these people have uh, uh, certain possibilities and they, they yield considerable power in the economic arena, right? And they start to uh, 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 basically uh, uh, become aware of the fact that they also need to uh, learn the language of power as Boré has, has, has termed it. Uh, so this quest for strategic autonomy in areas like cyber and defense, migration and energy. And I think in the two latter er uh, areas, migration and energy, uh, uh, there is an obvious importance of the region uh, uh, for the European Union. And actually, I'm not talking so much about natural gas and, and oil. That's, of course, also very important. But for the future uh, uh, plans of the European Union for a uh, green transition, where uh, things like green hydrogen produced in North Africa might play uh, a major role and is actually highlighted in the new European agenda uh, of the Euro uh, European Union. Um, if we take a look at this agenda, which is a kind of, of, of uh, blueprint for possible future action and its uh, five priority uh, policy uh, areas, I think there are a couple of interesting points. First, the five areas is uh, human development, good governance, and so on. So you find then secondly, uh, resilience and prosperity, more the economic area. Uh, then peace and securities, uh, uh, then, then migration and mobility, and finally, fifth uh, green transition. Uh, in the field of human development, good governance, you find a lot of the usual lyrics, yeah, youth empowerment, women empowerment, and so on. I don't want to belittle it, but it's kind of what we've gotten used to hear from the European Union, and, and it sounds really the same. I think artificial, artificial intelligence will soon be able to create these documents without any input of human beings. Yeah? And it will sound the same. But what is really interesting, they also come up with vaccines. Yeah? And obviously, 
Here, the European Union has really leverage. Yeah? It's a major export of vaccines. And I found it quite remarkable uh, what Charles Michel, the president of the European Council, said in March about vaccine diplomacy. I mean, a very strongly worded statement against Chinese and Russian vaccine diplomacy in the region uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, beyond it, saying these are countries with less desirable values than us. Yeah? So this is the kind of self-confident European Union we would have loved to see during Sofagate, yeah, when Charles Michel uh, uh, did not vacate his uh, 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 chair to let Ursula von der Leyen sit there, or at least he should have joined her on the sofa. Uh, to make a clear uh, statement, or also that we uh, uh, missed when uh, Jose Borrell was kind of uh, taken for a ride by Mr. Lavrov in Moscow during a press conference. So I think uh, there is a, a, a more muscular uh, uh, approach here on the rhetoric side. And yes, uh, the European Union has here really a, a, a strong position and should try it more via the COVAX uh, initiative, via a, mul a multilateral uh, a channel, uh, and I believe it will once it has vaccinated a larger share of its population. Then the second one is resilience. Resilience is the new buzzword of the European Union. It's attempt to have its, its cake and eat it too, right? Resilience, you can be also as a non-democratic uh, country. Uh, it has a focus on the quality of institutions, of trust levels beyond the state, kind of tends to outsource the responsibility for uh, 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 stability to civil society. Um, and uh, essentially the European Union, the new buzzword, the European Union uh, uh, is ready to, to focus more on kind of realpolitik in the region to cut deal with sometimes bad deals with sometimes uh, not so savory actors. Um, and the democratization agenda has kind of taken a backseat uh, during that process. But in the case of resilience, you will find uh, in the new agenda other things, sometimes quite surprising things, like increased use of the euro, right? Quite important in a time when the reserve uh, uh, holdings in dollar have declined. I mean, they're still very, very high, but they have declined. And the question is, will we move to a more multilateral uh, currency system? Um, so clearly, there is a, 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 a ambition there, there is uh, uh, awareness there that this is an important topic. Also reshoring appears, very important in the wake of the COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, we have seen the vulnerability of supply chains. And yes, here in North Africa, uh, most notably those two countries where uh, free trade negotiations are, are most advanced, Tunisia and Morocco, offer considerable opportunities in, uh, uh, um, uh, in kind of outsourcing uh, certain industrial processes to these countries more, uh, that are closer rather than uh, to Asia far away. In peace and security, well, um, this is obviously the weak point of the European Union. Uh, we see sometimes individual member state, uh, support, states supporting uh, different camps, for example, in the Libyan civil war, the Italians uh, side with the government in Tripoli and the French support uh, uh, Al-Haftar in, in, in the east of the country. So that is not exactly this kind of, of, of uh, uh, unanimity or kind of united front, uh, European foreign policy in the region uh, would require. Migration and mobility, my impression is the new agenda dreads uh, carefully. It must tread, tread carefully because obviously there are considerable disagreements between Western and Eastern Europe, between old and new Europe, uh, uh, if you want to paraphrase uh, uh, Rumsfeld, and these will only increase should uh, 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 for example, Marie Le Pen, uh, uh, God beware, uh, uh, have some electoral success uh, uh, next year, or uh, Italy, yeah, where uh, populist right-wing forces are also quite uh, strong. And then finally, the green transition here, uh, green, the green hydrogen uh, um, uh, strategy is highlighted. That, of course, uh, uh, is interesting because this could lead to an electrification or a, a, a use of renewables in transportation beyond the electrification of uh, transportation that is already ongoing, yeah? but it's only a relatively small uh, uh, part of the transportation sector. So with renewable green hydrogen, theoretically, you could also power uh, 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 ships, you could power heavy trucks, and you could, you could uh, uh, power planes for the intermediate uh, uh, range yeah? and some industrial uh, processes uh, as well. 
uh, big question mark behind it, to be honest, um, uh, because of the huge transmission losses of, of the technology. Also big question mark behind it because past um, attempts to have kind of a renewable energy revolution uh, 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 jointly with the Southern Mediterranean, the Des Desert Tech Initiative or the European uh, solar plan have failed. We can discuss the, 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 the problems or the challenges uh, uh, later on. Um, but overall, yes, this is a, a major thrust. It will require an integration of grids, yeah, where there's a major issue between Spain, which is an energy island, and, and France, for example. So the European Union, like in the field of natural gas, will need to do its homework. It tries to do it with the energy union, uh, um, because it's not so much the unreliability of Russian supplies, it's uh, that you have the the, the, the receiving and the transportation infrastructure within the European Union to make yourself less vulnerable. And we are seeing here the European Union has considerable leverage, for example, when it uh, 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 essentially brought the South Stream pipeline to fall uh, uh, by recurring to the third energy package legislation uh, uh, some years back. I leave it at that. So I think in the field of when the European Union decides to use its economic leverage for uh, foreign policy and it, it can be quite effective uh, uh, and can be quite powerful. That is not surprising for the largest economic bloc in the world. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Julian, uh, to come to, to you as our final final speaker, um, both Eckhart and, and Natalie outlined several of the, let's say, sort of strengths and weaknesses of the of the European Union when it comes or, or Europe more generally when it comes to the Middle East. Um, you recently uh, published a report on uh, promoting uh, European strategic sovereignty in the southern neighborhood. So um, building on what your speakers have said, um, how can you promote this strategic sovereignty and, and add more punch, let's say, to European policy towards uh, the MENA region? Thank you, Philip, and, and, and thank you for having me. Um, and, and, and I, I, I think I'll struggle to add much to, to what Natalie and Acha have already kind of laid out at the beginning here. Um, you know, and I, I find myself very much in agreement um, with a lot of what has been laid down here. Um, you know, the last 10 years um, have really kind of brutally exposed um, Europe's kind of vulnerability and, and unwillingness to step up and kind of try and shape its, its neighborhood um, in, in quite a dramatic way. And we've obviously seen this with, with migration. We've seen this with terrorism challenges. Um, we've seen this with kind of European internal divisions exposed in, in places like Libya and Syria, where really kind of our, our, our inability to, to step up has, has been kind of almost made, made, made more, co or, you know, almost, you could argue that the biggest kind of impediment to a kind of coherent approach there or, or a stronger approach has actually been kind of internal European divisions and fractures rather than actually the kind of complications on the ground as, as, as complicated as, as they are. Um, and I kind of, I very much agree with, with kind of Natalie's framing of it and, you know, kind of this, this, this inability on the European side to, to account for for quite a fundamental kind of global or regional kind of rebalancing over the last decade where you have seen since Obama a kind of a, a relatively decrease in, in US influence and, and that's been matched by an, a kind of increase of, of a regional or more global assertiveness whether it's kind of the Arab Gulf states whether it's Turkey whether it's the Russians and and the Europeans have been caught kind of in between um, for so long waiting and looking to the US um, historically to take the lead and, and, and then suddenly finding that kind of carpet pulled from beneath their feet and, and obviously under President Trump more, more brutally than, than under Obama or even Biden today, but clearly with a common trajectory um, that has left Europeans needing to look to, to their own kind of uh, sources of, of influence and, and kind of political willingness to step up to try and shape things and, and an unwillingness and an inability to do that. I think an unwillingness just given the kind of the scope of the challenges and the sense of being overruled by it, but also an inability given a sense of kind of uh, the internal divisions, given a sense that, 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 that these are, you know, what's been unfolding in the region has, has been kind of a, 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 hard, a series of hard power conflicts in which the Europeans were, were, were unable and unwilling to, to, to kind of make a difference. And, and hence, of course, 
why we see kind of the the, the new global or, or southern strategy laid out by our hearts very much focused on the kind of non hard power tools because that's precisely where, where Europeans do feel that they they have have some some more more ability to to shape the future so I mean put together and, and and it's been a weak position a weak hand and we've been exposed in Libya and Syria even frankly the nuclear deal where you know a lot of people talk about you know the Europeans having salvaged or kept the deal alive over the last five years i'm, I'm slightly more cynical and, and you know the, the nuclear deal stayed alive because the iranians made a strategic decision that it was in their interest um to, to stay engaged with the hope of a new u.s um president potentially coming around rather than because the europeans actually put anything on the table um to, to make a difference there um so so i mean that that paper that, that we at ecfr put out in a sense walked walked through the kind of the the, the series of of, of, of weaknesses and, and internal problems that have marred the European spon response. And, and I think sought to make the case that, look, this is a region that matters to Europe. This is not a region that is um, approaching anywhere near a kind of a, a, a sense of new stabilization. And I think, you know, there, there is a, a certain kind of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say naivety, but a, a kind of false optimism that is floating over the region now that kind of we we are headed back into a form of stability, authoritarian stability, what have you. You know, some of the conflicts are dying down, but if you look at all of the structural factors, the economics, the demographics, some of the kind of deeper fault lines that, that, that kind of lie between the key states, I mean, they are they are as 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 real as they ever have ever been, and if not more real. And you know, the the, the threat of of state collapse from from Lebanon across to Iran through Syria through Iraq, I think, is very real. Um, some of the economic trends and, and migratory challenges that are going to emanate from North Africa continue to, to hang out there. So I think this is a region that, 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 that we are going to have to address and, and, and step up on. And how we do that is, is immensely challenging because Europeans are going to continue to look to these longer term uh, tools of, of, of kind of governance of economics. And of course, these are the, the structural challenges that new, do need addressing. But it's a reality that kind of short term conflict, the kind of the geopolitics of the Russians and the Americans and the Turks is, is going to hang over, over over everything. I, you know, it's it's a tricky one to, to manage. And, and, you know, we can get into some of the specifics of, of, of the different um, uh, country specifics as we go into the conversation. I think the one thing I would just end on, though, is I think a point that Natalie made is that. You know, there is a certain kind of um, wish or, or, or hope amongst many Europeans that the Americans are going to come rolling back in and that we can go back to how it was. And, you know, Trump, Trump was an anomaly, but actually kind of things, things can, can, can find a working order and, and, and we can kind of play that, that second fiddle role to the US that, that we so want to do. And I think that is something that is clearly not going to happen. The Americans have, have made clear an intent uh, that they want to, to move beyond the Middle East, whether it's because of energy, whether because it's because of kind of broader geopolitics with China and what, what have you. And, you know, this is a region that Europeans can't walk away from. They can't escape. The, the challenges and the kind of the, the co-linkages are too deep. Um, and, and so, you know, Natalie laid it out as a kind of whether Europeans um, can kind of turn a blind eye or, or, or they're gonna, gonna, gonna step up. I think they're gonna have to at one point recognize um, that the Americans are not going to provide that facade, provide that cover for them that allows them um, to, to kind of feign indifference and to feign management. Um, and I think that's a fundamental challenge that, that the Europeans have, have, have over the next kind of generation or, or kind of the, the coming decades because the linkages run deep and, and there's no kind of quick ways around this. But, but um, let, let me stop there. We can get into some of the, the specifics where we can have, perhaps get, get a bit more clarity. But, but it, it, it's a very tricky situation. And, and you know, obviously, amidst the kind of the array of fundamental kind of foreign policy challenges that, that Europe faces, there aren't too many in European political capitals who really think this is somewhere that Europeans can really kind of step up and, and, and fundamentally make a difference. And I think that's obviously a core dilemma that we have to wrestle with somehow. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Well, thanks to all three of you. Um, while you were, were talking, the first questions have come in. Actually, one of them relates to something, Julian, that you said right right just not just before, so I, I'll just give it back to you straight away. It's from uh, Mehdi, uh, Mehdi Askari, who's um, director at the Nuclear Institute at Harvard, um, and it's on the um, EU's role in the JCPOA. Um, he states that the EU obviously is seen as um, having a key role in getting the JCP 
OA going, but then it uh, was basically unable to alleviate the economic effects um, of sanctions on Iran when Donald Trump tr uh, pulled out of it. Um, so he just um, uh, wants to, or he just asked why the EU has proved uh, in, ineffective in um, combating the, the American withdrawal from the JCPOA. Um, Julian, do you want to maybe take this since you just mentioned this briefly already? Sure, I'll be very quick in it, but it, you know, it points to a common issue. Um, you know, many Europeans would say that the reason they, they couldn't do more was, was you know, almost a technical one. It, 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 European secondary sanctions, um, you know, an inability to kind of navigate the power of the US dollar, um, and that really kind of hamstrung the ability to, to operationalize INSTEX or kind of an ongoing economic relationship with Iran that, that would actually kind of balance out and mitigate the US withdrawal. But I think, you know, fundamentally, it, it's, it's a question of kind of a political inability and unwillingness uh, to step up and, and, and take the steps that would have been needed to provide the kind of messaging um, and, and, uh, uh, and, and kind of outputs that Iran needed to, to, to stay engaged with, with the deal. I think, you know, by the end of, of the Trump administration, um, Tehran had effectively given up on, a, on, on Europeans because Europe was fundamentally unable to deliver any kind of ongoing economic routes that got around US sanctions. So it, it, it's a technical reason with a, with a fundamental kind of political unwillingness um, to stand up uh, uh, kind of against wh where the US administration was going. And that, you know, obviously, again, that, that points to Syria, it points to Libya, it points, points to, to the whole range of issues. There's, you know, the, the, the degree to which Europeans are prepared to politically own, stand up and take the risks, pay the cost that would be necessary um, to try and advance the European agenda here. Can I just jump in on this? Because I, I think it's, I mean, I think the JCPOA story in its in its different phases really highlights, in a sense, what is it that Europeans can and are willing to do, and where, when is it that they find themselves totally at a loss, yeah? I mean, I think, you know, sort of both the period leading up to 2015 and, of course, now the period beginning in 2021 kind of really highlight the fact that we kind of know what we're doing when we're playing second fiddle. Uh, in a situation where we essentially concur with where the United States wants, wants to go, we can play a sort of useful supporting role to that shared end. When either we don't agree with the United States, uh, see a uh, period uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with, so either when we disagree uh, or when the United States just basically is not interested in acting at all. So it's not that we disagree with the United States, it's just that the United States itself is missing in action we as Europeans are completely at a loss. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, I think J.C. Poe, as I said, in his various phases, really highlights this, this point. We just know what to do in a particular context. Take that context away and we're lost. Fantastic, thank you. Um, uh, Eckhart, in your comments, you mentioned the word realpolitik and um, making difficult deals. So uh, there's a question which I think I'll just um, uh, give back to you or, or direct to you. It is from uh, Naman Haptam at the Faculty of History here at Cambridge. Um, and he asks, uh, with Arab countries reopening embassies in Damascus um, and um, uh, other major powers doing the same, supporting um, Damascus, um, is it only a matter of time before the EU and its member states will try to renormalize relations with Syria? Uh, well, I don't have a crystal ball, to be honest. Um, and again, I, I could imagine they wouldn't do it on their own, but only following the US. Um, uh, obviously, there's an interest in some sort of reconstruction, and that will uh, uh, need some sort of compromise with the power that be, and that is mostly the Assad regime. Yeah. But not only, obviously, because uh, uh, parts of the territory are still governed by other forces. And, and uh, yeah, so uh, I don't have a crystal ball. I think they will play again, would rather play the second fiddle and maybe uh, uh, come up with the checkbook uh, uh, for some reconstruction. Uh, but I don't think they will take the lead there. Mm. Is it, do you think it's something that will rather, um, that, that is something that should be considered like early this process soon? Or do you think that's something in your opinion that should be avoided uh, for the moment, that sort of step? 
I mean, obviously, uh, it's the most unsavory regime in the region that you can imagine of. So on the other hand, and I don't think right now Syria is a priority, right? Uh, the, the, the focus is very much on Libya and the Sahel and migration from there. So uh, Syria will be only on the radar screen of the European Union again once, if and once there are refugees coming, as, as cynical that might sound. And, and right now the danger is not there, either because so many have left already or because the European Union has put the deals in place to prevent that from happening. Uh, uh, so my impression is when I talk to people uh, at the European Union, the focus is very much uh, on, on Libya uh, and the Sahel and Syria is kind of uh, yesterday's news at the moment, until it isn't. Uh, Julian, did you want to come in on this? Um... No, I was just, I, I look at Syria a lot and I was, I was just going to say, you know, my, my sense is that, um, you know, we're a long way off from, from any kind of meaningful re-engagement with, with um, Syria from a European, from a broader European state. I mean, obviously you have a number of countries that are European states that are already kind of bilaterally opening up ties. Um, but, but, you know, this is one of the issues where kind of a European hardline, a principled hardline has been able to kind of maintain itself o o over the, the years. But, but of course, this is one of the areas where we're going to see some of these dilemmas in the sense that we're wrestling with come out quite acutely in, in, in the period ahead, because, you know, Syria is a bit like Lebanon today, where um, the Europeans are saying, um, you know, any, any kind of engagement, any meaningful support is going to be contingent on a set of reforms um, that is wholly desirable, but which we know the, the incumbent regimes will not embark upon because fundamentally that means kind of negotiating themselves out of power. Um, and so I think then, you know, the Europeans face this dilemma of how do you help mitigate um, the threats that will come from kind of state collapse across the Levant, the, as well as the kind of humanitarian and, and kind of civilian suffering across these, 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 these countries, um, when you've tied yourselves to a set of conditions that, that, that can't be matched. And I think Europeans are going to have to work, work out ways um, to navigate some of their red lines um, uh, to, 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 to be slightly more creative here and to say whether it's in Lebanon, whether it's in Syria, whether it's in Iraq, you know, we recognize that there is a fundamental political problem here. There is no desire to normalize, to legitimize. And yet we recognize at the same time that we need to do more um, to provide some degree of support in terms of helping stabilization challenges, in terms of meeting humanitarian needs. And, you know, this is going to need some degree of kind of real politique that, that Europeans haven't really showed on, on Syria to date, whether that's kind of rolling up the sleeves and, and kind of doing diplomacy with the, with the Russians in a way we haven't done to date, whether that's trying to think about how you leverage some of the Arab regional states that are re-engaged um, to create some positive avenues um, you know, there, there, there are a series of, of different tracks. I think the fact that the Americans now seem to have taken their foot off a maximum pressure campaign against the Syrian regime, um, not because of their own desire to normalize, but, but simply because they're also recognizing that actually they need, they need to create some breathing space. That may create some, some, some room for the Europeans to, to think a bit differently here. But these, this is one of the issues that, that is clearly going to be on the European agenda in the period ahead. Um, and they are going to have to internalize how do you navigate some of these dilemmas. Yeah. I mean, just very quickly on this, you know, I, I think, you know, at the heart also of what Julian was saying here is that ultimately, um, you know, Syria really highlights the incredibly uncomfortable uh, choice that we're ducking once again of how is it that you exert influence which obviously you would consider to be positive influence, huh? and, uh, in a context, in, a, in basically in the war uh, that you lost. Okay, you didn't fight it, but <laughs> those that you were, uh, okay, I wouldn't say those that you were supporting, those that you were against have won. <laughs> I think that's probably the sort of most accurate way of putting it. And it's an incredibly uncomfortable uh, question because giving an answer to it requires a willingness to, to an extent, getting your hands dirty in order to have positive influence. But you need to get your hands dirty in a situation like this. So what do we do as Europeans? We do what Europeans normally do. We just don't answer the question at all. And so we do nothing. 
Okay, great. Thank you for um, for your answers to this. Um, another one, which um, since you talked a lot about, you were all very pronounced in your uh, view on America. Um, Garrett Fitzgerald from Penn uh, points out that the one place where the Americans won't walk away from is Israel. Um, um, uh, but he says they will need a dancing partner to make any progress on Palestine. Uh, does the uh, change in the Israeli government away from Netanyahu and the ascent of Biden offer a narrow window of opportunity to partner with the US to revive considerations of a two-state solution, he asks. Um, does anybody in, in particular want to take this one on the, on the peace process? I don't see a, um, a, a Biden administration queue to restarting the Middle East peace process. I mean, I think, you know, that Garrett's absolutely right. You know, the United States is not going to uh, walk away from, from Israel. But that does not, I mean, that, if, in fact, not only is it not tantamount to restarting the Middle East peace process, but unfortunately, in this particular understanding of what it means to support Israel, um, is actually perfectly kind of, you know, compatible with it. Um, so, you know, I, and I think we've seen it in this latest uh, outburst of, uh, of violence where the United States will be interesting in trying to see what regional powers can do uh, to this effect. Um, but I don't think, again, you know, I, I think that the era of a US playing a dominant role in trying to shepherd the Middle East peace process, to be honest, I, I just see that era as having gone. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, the, another question uh, is from Luigi Scassieri from the Center for European Reform. Um, and it's a very interesting one because I think it highlights the sort of split of European foreign policy making where you have both Brussels and the European Union institutions like the External Action Service, but also the member states individually. Um, so his question is the following. Do you think there is a risk that Europeans will be pushed to pick sides in the region between powers like Turkey, the UAE, China and Russia, and that member states might end up picking different sides? It's, it's already happening in Lib Libya and the Eastern Med. I mean, I think, you know, the, the kind of the, the alignment of, of, of European countries behind the kind of the Emiratis and Turks on different sides and that the way that that is fed into European divisions over Libya, or European divisions over Eastern Med, how to approach Turkey, um, very much reflect that. So, so and, and, you know, the, the, the internalization into European shores um, of, a, of a kind of Middle Eastern fault line between the Emiratis and the Turks, I think is very dangerous when you see kind of, you know, Gulf military bases being established in, in the likes of Cyprus and, and, and Greece, you know, very much to, to, to try and confront Turkey. So, I, you know, this, this is real, this is happening, um, and this is wholly debilitating to the European ability to kind of try and shape their, their near neighborhood. And, you know, the, again and again one comes back to the the, the, the the case that you know if there was anywhere that the that europe should have stepped up and been able to manage their neighborhood it was libya you know this was somewhere that was effectively given to the europeans by the americans they were told to get on with it this is obviously going to uh, geographically right there acute interest at stake um and yet europeans have, have not just struggled in the face of kind of intense regional and global interventions but they've just marginalized themselves by their inability to forge a, a common path. And, you know, Libya is today or has been over, over the recent past, essentially a kind of battleground in, in the fight about Turkey, um, which, which is kind of torn, torn, torn through Europe. So it's real, it's happening, and, and I think it's very worrying. Um, yes, Natalie, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with, with Julian. I mean, just to sort of add, um, Perhaps a more positive note to this, and I, I don't know whether there is, uh, you know, you know, one will have to sort of wait and see whether this actually flourishes into, into something. But I mean, I think that, I mean, certainly again, let, let's just pick Libya as a case, because I think it really epitomizes what we're, what we're talking about here. I think there certainly was a moment, uh, and to an extent there still is obviously a moment, in which different members say, in the absence of the United States, because I, again, I, I, I really do think that this is the precondition uh, for, to, for, for, for exposing divisions that were there, that, that so long as the United States did play that more dominant role, they were not as apparent as they are now. You, you know, sort of exit the United States, 
it enter regional powers, member states being pushed, you know, Italy, France being pushed in different directions. Okay, fine. Um, now, you know, again, you know, the sort of ultimate choice that I think all of the member states are, are, are facing is what do we prefer? Do we prefer uh, sort of the bickering about amongst ourselves, which basically means that both UAE and Turkey and everyone else is going to do their thing mm -hmm. in their interest? Or uh, do we have at least that lowest common denominator of agreement uh, in seeing that actually this happening is not in our collective interest. So the only positive signal that I'm seeing is, you know, you see the way in which, for instance, the Draghi government is trying to work actually very closely with Macron at the moment on Libya as the signal of, you know, there must be some, you know, a degree of awareness that actually, yes, we disagree, but surely we agree enough. We agree on the fact that it's not in our interest for the regional powers just to kind of do what, what, what they're doing. I don't know whether it's going to consolidate into something, but the fact that there is an attempt at the moment between Italy and France to try and talk Libya is at least a signal that they recognize that this is important. Okay, excellent. Um... Eckhart, in your outline, you mentioned a number of instruments and uh, and policy fields uh, where, where Europe is sort of active in the Middle East. Uh, one question that came to mind, and I think is a quite classic one almost in this regard, is, is the question of hard power. Do you think in terms of how the EU approaches the region to have an impact, does it does it have to have more of a hard power, let's say, instrument in its in its foreign policy approach towards the Middle East um, to, to, to have more have more punch, let's say, or can it can it achieve influence without the, a, a stronger hard power option? Well, I I guess uh, things like like Libya and surveying arms uh, trade with Libya uh, requires hard power instruments and 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 naval surveillance and so on. Uh, the challenge is probably for Europe rather to to achieve some sort of consensus. Yeah? Uh, and how can it do that within the existing structure? Uh, it's obviously a challenge. Yeah? Uh, Mr. Boré, during one of these recent webinars, said Europe does not need to speak with one voice, but it should have one message. But I'm afraid it doesn't have one message. Right? So, OK, you uh, uh, probably should work first on that, find some sort of consensus, and maybe then uh, try to find to, uh, a way how to bring uh, such messages better across uh, and I think it will need to have to uh, have some sort of qualified majority decision making uh, if it thinks it can continue uh, uh, basically wait, waiting these things out uh, waiting until some sort of minimal consensus falls into place uh, uh, I, 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 I'm afraid uh, uh, it will not be taken seriously um, in this part of the world. And I'm also afraid that maybe uh, it's it's simply really a lot of voices, right? Uh, uh, maybe a core EU would be uh, uh, in, in, in a better place to, to, to for some sort of swift decision making. And as I've said, I think uh, it needs to come uh, to some sort of sanctioning mechanism for wayward members like 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 Hungary, yeah? and and Poland might jo might join uh, Hungary soon, yeah, as a non democracy within the EU. So, if you are not even able to to bring your own house in order, how are uh, how are you supposed to lecture people in the southern Mediterranean? Um, yes, you you actually. Oh, sorry, Julie, Julie, can, you're... can can I can I just say one thing about the hard power thing because I think it's yeah. kind of kind of interesting and relevant. Um, you know, clearly Europe has been out of the mix in part in the last decades because it has been a hard power decade. Um, but, but it, you know, if one is trying to put an optimistic slant on things, um, you know, there does seem to be a regional and global shift at the moment, you know, associated, I think, to some re respect with, with Biden coming in and a kind of his focus on diplomacy and multilateralism, but also in a sense, a reflection of the failure of the Trump kind of gung her approach, um, which actually fed this kind of hard power dynamic for a while. And I think, you know, we are seeing regional actors re-engaging with each other diplomatically at the moment, whether it's Iran and the Saudis talking in Iraq, whether it's Arab states talking to, to, to Damascus, 
whether it's kind of after the Turkish intervention in, in, in Libya, a new political process there. I mean, there is, you know, a set of diplomatic um, dialogues and tracks outgoing there. And, and, you know, from a European perspective, this is obviously creates a framework that plays more to European strengths. I mean, once you start talking about, you know, stabilization and governance and economics, you know, this is where Europe does have cards to play. And I think it's quite clear that if, you know, li Libya erupts back into conflict or if kind of the Iranians and, and the Saudis clash militarily, the Europeans are not going to have that hard power agency or ability. And, and you know, they're not going to have it. Let, let's not daydream. Let's not pretend that there is going to be a moment where the Europeans wake up anytime soon and say, oh, look, you know, we, we need to activate ourselves here. But, you know, something is changing. There is a moment of opportunity. And I think, you know, if, if Europeans were going to be forward looking, if they were going to try and take the initiative here, you know, this is the kind of the moment where Europeans could say, look, this is a space where we can operate. This is where we can act. You know, this is where the Germans can push forward a process in Libya. This is where the EAS and the E3 can really try and step back into the JCPOA, again, under an American umbrella, but, but trying to do more there. So I would say rather than focusing on that hard power dimension, let's think about the tools that the Europeans are able to bring today to the mix and think about the opportunities that, that may have been created with this kind of shift towards a more diplomatic approach after a decade of exhaustion and, and conflict. I mean, if I could just add to this, I mean, you know, I think that in all honesty, since, um, you know, Libya 2011, um, you know, so in, including Syria since then, um, there has never really been uh, a question concerning Europeans or Americans, for that matter, intervening militarily um, in the way in which we intervened, or rather the US intervened in Afghanistan or in Iraq, or, or indeed as inter the intervention took place in, in Libya itself. So, because, I mean, you know, when we talk about Europeans lacking hard power, that is the kind of hard power we lack. We don't lack the hard power necessary to do the kind of things that actually would be required of us. Um, so, you know, when we talk about Libya today, we're not talking about military intervention in Libya. We're talking about whether there could be a security, a European security role in trying to consolidate the ceasefire, in trying to ensure that that ceasefire does not simply crystallize a division, but actually does enable the country to move towards elections. So that is the kind of, if you like, military component that we're talking about. And we do have the capabilities to do that. What we're lacking is something else, which is the willingness to take risk, which is why I highlighted the risk point uh, earlier. So, you know, because otherwise we just kind of, you know, tend to get stuck in this, um, well, you know, we, we don't have hard power and the region needs hard power and hey, you know, let's pull our hair out, there's nothing we can do. Well, actually, there is something we can do. We just choose not to do it. <laughs> uh, on top of what Julian was saying, and I think he's absolutely right, that in a sense, now the region, I mean, although Biden has not done a great deal in the region, but its very existence has created a greater willingness amongst regional players to talk to one another. I mean, they haven't fundamentally changed what their goals are, um, but the very fact that there isn't a sort of, you know, black and white winner takes it all approach that Trump conveyed has automatically meant that Turks are talking to Emiratis and to Egyptians and, uh, you know, so things are happening, which obviously makes the region one more amenable again, to the kind of approach that Europeans would have. But again, it requires Europeans to want to take that responsibility and that risk with the capabilities that they have. But they don't need to invent stuff that they don't have. I mean, it'd be good if we also sort of acquired greater capabilities, but not because we have to use them in the Middle East today, to be honest. Um Okay, excellent. I we have we're coming towards the end of our hour. Um, I just want to very quickly go through two final points. Um, uh, Bruno Schmidt Feuerhead is is asking whether the EU needs institutional reforms to step up its foreign policy game. Now, Eckhart, you already kind of answered part of that question by 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 talking about qualified majority voting, and you you give a very clear opinion on this. Um, maybe Natalie, I, I would sort of address the question to you in a way of asking. Do, does, the foreign, does the European Union in the Middle East need, need some sort of new institutional framework uh, to replace the neighbor policy union for the Mediterranean? We all, there, there seems to be stuff there. Do you just need 
something else entirely as a sort of new, um, you know, new shell here? Or is it more about a specific policy goal, like saying, like you just said, fix Libya as some sort of flagship project and then work from there, let's say, in a very simplistic way? Um, I, I think it would be a bad idea for the EU to simply sort of invent now some sort of brand new institutional framework for the region, simply because that is the kind of thing that you do, assuming that it's the right thing to do, but that's the kind of thing that you do once in a sense, it, 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 the region and the broader world in a sense crystallizes into something. I mean, I think now both the region and the international system as a whole are really undergoing a phase of very profound transition. So I think so the grand big designs is not what we need to do. I think what we need to do is, um, take greater responsibility on X, Y, and Z. Uh, and it doesn't have to be done by everyone acting together. I mean, it'd be nice if, and this goes to the point about qualified majority voter voting, or at least, if you like, constructive abstention. You don't need to go all the way down to qualified majority voting. Um, you know, if there is a group of member states that actually do want to take greater responsibility, it'd be nice if others didn't block them. They don't have to do it themselves, just kind of, you know, <laughs> let, let things go, go ahead. Um, and, and, and it can be done both in an EU institutional framework or it can be done through different, you know, sort of uh, contact groups. I mean, again, you know, take the E3 slash EU on Iran. So there are different ways of doing things uh, on different crises, on different issues. What it does require is for someone to want to take greater responsibility and greater risk. Okay, um, and then a final question, which I think I'll address to Julian, also from Bruno Schmidt Feuerherd. Um, on how Brexit um, has impacted or will impact the EU foreign policy in the Middle East uh, and that difference between Europe and the EU. Do you, do you see an Im impact there already or is it potentially even an area where um, you know, the UK and the EU could find some sort of cooperation in a post-Brexit era? I think it, it does a couple of things. One, it, it gives greater kind of centrality to France within the EU system. Um, and, and, you know, whereas before, I mean, the, the French and the Brits obviously being the kind of dominant European players in the Middle East, without the Brits in, in, in the EU system, the French are able um, to, to continue to kind of be more assertive and, and try and shape things. So I think that's one thing. And that, I mean, who knows how this will play out? I mean, th th there's also a kind of counter dynamic in which other member states kind of rally around the Germans to try and create a, a counterbalance and the extent that, you know, the, the question that then has to be asked is the extent to which Germany is prepared to actually step up um, and, and, and kind of emerge as, as a more significant player in the region um, alongside France. The other question, I guess, is the degree to which um, the UK being out of, um, out of the EU um, creates competition between the UK and the EU rather than convergence. And that's obviously a worry. I mean, look, let, let's be honest. The, in places like the Gulf, the EU has not been very relevant for a long time. And it, it's, the, you know, French-British competition, economic strategic competition has been a dominant feature of the landscape for some time. Does that now become more intense? Does the British desire for trade deals um, push it to align itself, make deals with Gulf states or other members or other regional states that come at the detrimental or in a way that, that, that weakens uh, Europe, EU and the region. Does the EU without the UK and all that it brings in terms of capability, in terms of resources on the ground, in terms of knowledge of the region um, become weaker? I mean, I think these are all questions that, that to be honest, still have very much to be answered. Um, but, but, but clearly kind of things will change and, and dynamics will, will, will kind of be, 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 be impacted by this. I mean, Natalie probably has a better take of how, how this plays out within, a, within an intra-EU perspective. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Um, we have come to the end of our hour. Um, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, and um, I think the most important thing for me to say at this point is thank you very much to our three speakers, um, to Natalie Tocci, Eckhard Wertz, and Julian barnes Daisy for um, giving us such, an, uh, such a deep outline of, of what's going on in terms of the EU uh, and the Middle East and an outlook of what we can look out for in the, in the future uh, of this field. Um, from our end, uh, this will conclude the webinar. As I said at the beginning, a recording of the event will be soon on our website. Um, and on our website, you can also find many other events and since last week, or sorry, since a few weeks also, podcasts on global affairs and international politics. Uh, if you uh, in the audience are not currently receiving our emails, 
you can sign up to our mailing list using the link that is posted in the chat or from the center's homepage. Thank you and goodbye.